Good morning, everyone. My name is Vince Cerf. I'm Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist at Google. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the 2014 meeting of IPN SIG. Uh, my job this morning is to give you a little background on the history of the program that led to the delay and disruption tolerant networking protocols and the notion of a solar system internet. Uh, let me begin, however, by acknowledging a colleague who passed away last year who was absolutely instrumental in the development of these protocols and in pursuing this in the context of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and later NASA, and that's Adrian Hook. Adrian had been at um, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory for uh, what I think must have been over 25 years. He came somewhere around 1976 and was very involved in the standardization of protocols. And so in 1998, when I began thinking what should we be doing to make the Internet uh, useful in uh, space, uh, I discovered that Adrian and his team at JPL had already been doing this, and so when we met, we were completing each other's sentences in uh, just 30 seconds after meeting. Our discussion centered on plans for Mars and the exploration of Mars. You'll recall that some missions had been sent in the 1960s, the most spectacular one of 1976, the two Viking landers, and subsequently the Pathfinder mission in 1997, and then the 2004 rovers, the 2008 Phoenix lander, and then the Mars Science Laboratory, not counting the orbiting satellites that mapped Mars. So there was a lot of focus of attention at JPL on the exploration of Mars, and the question that our team came up with was, what kinds of networking could we offer that would be more robust and more useful than point-to-point -point radio links? And that led us to the idea of supporting interplanetary, internet-like communication. As you see here, uh, all of these various devices, the orbiters and the landers, uh, became part of the story because when the rovers landed, their point-to-point -point radio link from Earth, from the surface of Mars to Earth, uh, ran into some problems. The radios didn't function in the way they should have. And in the end, they were reprogrammed to use a different radio, an X-band radio, uh, and a, the radios in the orbiters in order to use them in store and forward style. Adrian and his group at JPL had already developed uh, file transfer protocols that you know, use store and forward methods, and so it was a natural step to adapt the necessary communication from the surface to go through the orbiting satellites and then relay things back uh, to the deep space network. So to date, 99.9% .9 of all the data coming back from the Mars missions have been through the store and forward system. Uh, when we started the program in 1998, we thought we could use TCP IP, but we discovered very quickly that it didn't work at interplanetary distances, and it's pretty obvious why. The distances between Earth and Mars lead to uh, radio delays from seven minutes to 40 minutes round trip, and the TCP flow control doesn't work very well at that rate. The other problem is planetary motion. The planets are in rotation, and we haven't figured out how to stop that. So uh, in order to deal with the fact that something on the surface can't talk when it's on the wrong side of the planet, you needed to cope with disrupted communication. So we had a variable delay and disrupted environment, which led to uh, the design of the, uh, the um, DTN protocols. Uh, another point uh, worth making is that these problems also show up in terrestrial environments, tactical radio jamming, for example, in military uh, scenarios, or radio shadow, you're under a bridge and you can't get uh, radio connectivity, or just loss of signal, all contribute to loss and potential variable delay, leading to the, uh, these DTN protocols being useful in terrestrial context contexts as well. The bundle protocol had a number of features, and because this is an abbreviated version of my earlier talk, uh, I'm not going to go through them in detail. But I will say that many of these mechanisms have proven to be useful not only for deep space communication, but also for uh, communications on the surface of Earth. And we will hear later today several examples uh, of successful implementation in several different contexts. There are many contributors now to the DTN program, and although it began at the Jet Propulsion Lab, it now engages virtually all of the uh, NASA facilities and other countries, Japan, Europe, uh, and they are either using or demonstrating these protocols uh, in various ways. 
The consultative committee on space data systems is charged with standardizing communication protocols, and they are in the middle of standardizing the bundle protocol, the link lighter transport protocol, and other uh, related protocols that are becoming part of the uh, interplanetary internet suite. What we hope to accomplish in the long run with the standardization is to allow all spacecraft, regardless of who makes them, uh, be capable of communicating using these protocols, either for their primary scientific missions or after those missions complete, uh, to be used as store and forward nodes in an expanding uh, interplanetary relay system, which in effect will be able to support both manned and robotic space exploration. So over the remaining decades of the uh, 21st century, I hope and anticipate that we will see a growing backbone of space communication. That's not the end of the story, however, because DARPA has funded uh, a study for the design of an interstellar spacecraft, not an implementation, just the design. Uh, and the problem there is propulsion uh, and control and navigation and communication. We need a propulsion system that will go up to 20% the speed of light. We need to get there to that speed at about 50 years into the mission because we have to slow down when we get to the other end. Otherwise, we'll only get one picture as we speed through the Alpha Centauri system at 20% the speed of light. We have a navigation question because the spacecraft has to be able to navigate itself autonomously. We can't do mid-course corrections interactively as we do in interplanetary space because the signals just take too long to go back and forth. When you're a light year away, it takes a year for the signal to get there and another year for it to come back to find out what happened to a mid-course correction. So um, we have to do uh, autonomous navigation. And the other problem is communication. How do I generate a signal from four light years away? And how do I detect it back here in our solar system? One answer may be using uh, very high power, very, very short pulse lasers, femtosecond lasers in particular. Uh, they can squeeze a lot of energy into a short period of time, giving a very significant spike, which in theory should be detected uh, de detectable from four light years away. However, the signal will have dissipated significantly despite the highly collimated radar or uh, laser beam. And so now you know why we need the interplanetary backbone to build a synthetic aperture receiver to reassemble the signal coming back from Alpha Centauri. There is another possibility, and that's to use the sun's gravity to build a gravity lens and situate a spacecraft at 550 astronomical units away from the sun where that uh, uh, light bending effect of the sun's gravity would lead to a focal point and reassemble the signal coming back from Alpha Centauri that way. Uh, that's a good way to test a propulsion system that can get us up to 20 percent the speed of light. It's 55 billion miles away, which is about four times farther than the current voyagers have reached over the last 33 years. Finally, there's more, and that's the terrestrial possibilities. We'll hear more about those today. Uh, I think we've already made proposals uh, among us to use um, store and forward methods uh, for uh, the existing telephone network, uh, perhaps with the uh, long-term um, LTE versions of, uh, of the uh, cell phone systems. It's been proposed to use DTN and public safety mesh networking for peer-to-peer -peer communication without the need for uh, base stations. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer applications in disrupted environments where parties can hear each other if they're nearby and have to store and forward in order to uh, propagate signals further. Sensor networks and the Internet of Things are other beneficiaries of this kind of delay and disruptive tolerant communications. And so I think we can anticipate that DTN will have a role to play. Many of the things that you'll hear today illustrate how far we have gotten from purely theory to real implementations and real data. And that, I think, is a very important theme in today's meeting. So I'll stop there. I look forward to uh, sharing with you uh, information that uh, you might find useful on this last slide. You'll be able to find more. And of course, the reports that you hear today will augment your understanding of where we are with DTN. Thank you.